Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Tavener and I'm your host of Any Further Questions. You are listening to episode two of series two. If you haven't listened to them already, seven episodes of Any Further Questions are available to listen to on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts. So please do go and check them out now. My guest today is our Frank Jackson Foundation Professor of the Environment, Miles Allen, and he has joined me to answer a heap of questions we didn't have time to get to during his first lecture of his new series, When Net Zero, The Climate Breaking Distance. Welcome, Miles. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Yeah, nice good. to be here. Thank you. As well as being our Frank Jackson Foundation Professor of the Environment, Miles is also Professor of Geosystem Science at the University of Oxford. He has contributed extensively to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, including as coordinating lead author for the 2018 IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade. He has published extensively on how human and natural influences on climate contribute to observed climate change and extreme weather risk, and the implications for adaptation and mitigation policy. So, we have lots of questions to get through. I'll start with um, one that was the most highly rated um, on our system. Following the changes announced by our Prime Minister at the end of September, is it likely that we are going to hit our 2030 target, which is a reduction of emissions by 45%, or our 2050 target, which is net zero? Well, I think the government would agree that these changes make it less likely that we're going to meet the 2030 target. But in the Prime Minister's speech, he was very keen to stress we're still committed to the 2050 target. And this is where the breaking distance analogy really helps out. It's saying, well, I'm not going to break yet, but then I'm going to break really hard. Two two consequences of that. First of all, the longer you put off hitting the brakes, the warmer the eventual temperature we end up at. We don't know the breaking distance of the planet. We don't know how fast we can stop the warming. And that's why it's really important to start early and suggesting, oh, well, we'll put it off for another five years, um, and then we'll start thinking about it um, after that, that's flawed logic. The idea that we'll end up in the same place, there's another really important physical point to make, which is the idea we won't be in the same place. If we put off reducing emissions for five years now, and then somehow manage to reduce them even faster, so we manage to get to net zero in 2050, first of all, we'll probably be worse off because we'll have dithered for another five years and ended up having to spend more on the transition and doing it really fast. Remember, the faster a transition happens, the more stuff you have to basically just chuck in the bin. And, and that's what's the most expensive part of, of the whole um, exercise. And the, the planet as a whole would be warmer. If the whole world followed that path, every five years delay adds another tenth of a degree to peak warming. So, and every tenth of a degree matters because it, it increases the chances of extreme weather events. The UK's greenhouse gas emissions is less than 1% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. How does the UK decarbonisation effort and additional costs to nation, how will it affect global greenhouse gas emissions? Well, broadly speaking, yes, we're 1% of emissions, so we're 1% of the problem at the moment. But we're not 1% of the problem historically, because we started dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere a good 100 years before anybody else really caught on. So it, it, the idea that, oh, because we're only small, we, we don't matter um, is very misleading. We also have outsized influence scientifically. I'm proud to say, but also politically in that we have been seen around the world as a leader in the climate space. So if we go into reverse, reverse gear on climate, I think a lot of other countries are going to pick up on that. And that could really do do major damage. It's all going to cost a lot of money. Um, and we had a question, how many billions will the UK have to pay per year for A, net zero and B, decarbonisation? Where is the money coming from and what will be the impact on the consumer? Well, I think it's really important to think of this in terms of decarbonizing products rather than decarbonizing economies. I don't know how much natural gas we'll still use in 2050. That's going to depend on a lot of decisions we make about how much power we generate, continue to generate from natural gas by that stage. Um, how many homes we still heat with natural gas and so on. But I can tell you what it would cost to stop 
the remaining natural gas we use from calling, causing any further global warming. And that's about four pence per kilowatt hour. Now, that's about what the price cap has just come down in the past couple of weeks. So it's in, in, in the context of what we pay for fossil fuels, the cost of stopping those fossil fuels from causing global warming, which means, in effect, taking the carbon dioxide they generate back out of the atmosphere or capturing it at source if you can, and pumping it back under the North Sea, the cost of doing that is actually a relatively manageable fraction of what we spend on those fuels in the first place. I'd love to emphasize to people the difference between what we pay for gas and what it actually costs to deliver to our homes would pay to stop that gas from causing any further global warming by capturing all the carbon dioxide it generates and sticking it back under the North Sea twice over. I used to be able to say it twice over. They've just cut the price caps and now it's only one and a half times over. But that's still plenty, plenty feasible. Also on the topic of money, rather than spending it in the UK, why not invest a portion on other developing countries where you get greater bang for the buck in global emission reduction? Well, this is actually a really good point. And it's an and, not an or. I think, first of all, the idea that we should carry on enjoying using fossil fuels and just pay other people to not use them. I mean, that starts to sound a bit medieval, doesn't it? Or possibly even, you know, smacks of neo-imperialism. So we, we can't go down that route. But if we're making what the whole world can see is best efforts to reduce our own emissions. And to be fair, on the UK, we we have done relatively well so far. Then, yes, you know, it does make sense for us to be stepping up and helping other countries to reduce theirs. But the best way of all we can do that is by showing other countries how to do it ourselves and convincing them that it's not going to cost them an arm and a leg. So proving the technologies that allow us to reduce emissions, demonstrating them, showing people that they're going to work and that, you know, it's not going to be too painful. That's the best service we can do for other countries in the world. And the term net zero, we've used net zero a few times. And it seems like net zero can mean different things for different countries. We don't seem to have a global agreement on what net zero is. Um, you've mentioned in a previous lecture that Gabon, uh, a country in Africa, has declared that they've achieved net zero. How did they do this? The fact that we've been a bit vague on what net zero emissions actually means does rather keep me awake at night because I feel somewhat responsible for this. I mean, back in 2009, we thought it was kind of obvious what it meant. Um, at that time, nobody thought that the biosphere, that sort of trees and plants and so on, could really play that big a role in achieving what we called effectively zero emissions. We didn't actually use the phrase net zero when the first papers were published. Um, so we assumed that the only net in netting out any remaining use of fossil fuels was capture of carbon dioxide, engineered capture of carbon dioxide, and re-injecting that carbon dioxide back underground. That was the only technology we considered um, in, as, as the net in net zero. Uh, since then, there's been an explosion of interest in can we restore carbon to the biosphere, can we, by encouraging planting trees, for example, or encouraging mangroves to grow and so on. And this is a very, it's a very attractive way forward because it's relatively low cost. And of course, it, if it's done well, it can have all sorts of other benefits as well in terms of biodiversity and so forth. The difficulty is we, in those 2009 papers, we were totally counting on the biosphere anyway. It already mops up about half the carbon we release from burning fossil fuels. Um, they, they get absorbed by the biosphere and the oceans of the world. And at that time, we considered that a completely natural phenomenon. But now that carbon has a value, people have woken up to it and realized, wait a minute, you know, my land is absorbing carbon. I can take credit for that. 
and sell it or use it to declare that I've achieved net zero, even though I haven't stopped using fossil fuels at all. And that started to happen in a big way. And that introduces a massive gap in carbon accounting, which means we we could achieve, our, our carbon accounting rules are so sloppy at the moment, that we could actually achieve net zero without doing anything more than reducing global emissions of global emissions from fossil fuels by around a factor of two, we could say, oh, yeah, there we go, we're done. Um, because, you know, the uptake by the biosphere and oceans more or less balances that for will do for a couple of years, at least. Um, so we got to net zero. But of course, we haven't actually um, stopped global warming at all. In that situation, we'd have only reduced the rate of global warming by, you know, again, a substantial margin, but maybe about half. But some um, halving the rate of global warming is a long way off actually stopping it. To stop global warming, we have to balance the all the carbon dioxide we continue to produce from burning fossil fuels with actively capturing that carbon dioxide and disposing of it permanently, which at the moment means re-injecting it back underground. We had a comment here from someone saying that the Earth's temperature is never constant and always moving up and down in the past billions of years. Can this explain the rising Earth temperature naturally? We can't explain what's happening in global temperatures or European temperatures or even UK temperatures as a natural phenomenon. This is something we, we do in science all the time. We, we, if, if you're wondering, does this um, medicine work, for example, um, a lot of people, it's, it's an interesting thing that people don't, what, what scientists do is they assume it doesn't work and then see if they can explain the data they've got. Which may seem to sound a slightly perverse thing to do, but it's what we call hypothesis testing. And it's very standard. It's, it's been the standard approach to, to testing these questions um, in, in science, uh, all branches of science ever since the 1920s. Now, if we approach the problem of trying to explain the warming we've seen over the past 50 years with this hypothesis testing approach, we just can't explain it. If we assume human influence is not there, you can't explain what's happened. You've got to invoke a substantial role for human influence on climate, climate to explain the recent warming. There's an article um, that someone read saying that we're at 2.5 degrees centigrade rather than 1.5 degrees. How does UK decarbonisation investments affect this global temperature? So this is a really warm year for two overwhelming reasons. Of course, there's the fact that the world is warming and human influence is driving up global temperatures. We've also got an El Nino brewing in the Pacific. And so we're seeing extreme temperatures all over the world. And I'm sure that's what you're um, the, the, the questioner is referring to. The Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degrees that countries are aiming for, is where we want to limit long, the long-term temperature to. That's the, the warming which is actually due to human influence, not including these short-term fluctuations due to things like the El Nino in the Pacific. So uh, we're not there yet, but we're very close. It's also important to understand very close, meaning if we carry on at the rate we're going, we'll get to 1.5 in this long term temperature. We'll get there within a decade or so, even less, maybe. Now, the, the point is, and people really do need to understand this, the Paris Agreement committed the world to limit warming to well below two degrees and pursue efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So it's not that the Paris Agreement is all over null and void if we go past 1.5 degrees. It just means we've breached the most ambitious end of the range of targets that Paris was aiming for. And of course, the warmer it gets, the worse the impacts. Every tenth of a degree matters. So it doesn't, you know, if we get to 1.6, impacts will be worse than they would have been if we were at 1.5. But again, it's a bit like quitting smoking. You know, it's a really good idea to quit smoking. If you don't manage to quit smoking today, you can quit smoking tomorrow. Yes, it would have been a good idea for you to have quitted smoking yesterday, but it's still a good idea to get on with it. It's a good analogy. I quit smoking 10 years ago. Well done you. Yeah. How far of an impact do you think the global COVID lockdowns have had towards helping reach peak warming quicker, thus reducing the final number? 
The actual impact of COVID on global temperatures is pretty muted, actually. Um, emissions of carbon dioxide in particular, carbon dioxide is, it, it's the real a problem here because it's the gas that hangs around indefinitely. Um, so, and carbon dioxide emissions have recovered very quickly to pre-COVID levels. They bounced back um, surprisingly fast in many ways. There was an impact on other forms of pollution, which are much shorter lived. So you probably remember during COVID, we had pictures of you know how you could see the Himalayas from Delhi for the first time in a century and all that sort of thing. Um, but uh, those, those are, are short lived drivers of climate and the impact of that on that long-term temperature I was talking about, the 1.5 degrees, is pretty muted. And sticking to events that have happened this year, we had another question mentioning that oil usage apparently was the highest level this year. How does this affect 1.5 degrees centigrade target? And can we realistically affect anything? Well, we can both use less oil and change the way we use oil. So we can absolutely change the trajectory we're on. And again, there's no need for using oil to cause global warming. People need to appreciate this. Um, you could, the company that sells you petrol or diesel could stop the products they sell from causing global warming. But it would be expensive for them to do that. It'd cost them about 50 pence a litre. Now, um, you could say, um, you know, nobody would want petrol prices to go up by 50 pence a litre. Um, actually, that's probably much less than the aggregate profit, combination of royalties, taxes and everything else, um, that these companies are making already. So it's not obvious to me that actually in the long term, prices necessarily need to go up at all relative to where they are now, because they're already extremely high. But we need to do things differently. We need to make sure that, I mean, in effect, by 2050, we need to establish the principle that you can't sell stuff that causes global warming. And inevitably, that will make some of the stuff that we like to use more expensive because people will be having to pay to stop it causing global warming. But they can do that. They already know how to do that. So, so there's no inevitability about this. And one thing which does worry me is that people feel, well, I have to drive my car. I personally have to you know, it's my only way of getting to work. It's my only way. And, and, and when people are told it's all on you, they feel powerless and they feel a bit hopeless about the whole thing. And I'm sure that's sort of what your question is alluding to, saying, is there really anything we can do about this? The, the organizations that have what we call agency here, that the, the organizations that can really do something are government and big industry. And neither is going to do it on their own. The government can't do this on its own. Big industry won't do it on its own because it needs regulation to make a level playing field to require them all to move together. And what's encouraging, I find, is when I talk to people in industry about solving the climate problem, they're up for it, but they always say the same thing. It's got to be a level playing field, which means the government has a role to play in setting the rules. One needs the other, and it needs to be yeah. worth it for them to do it financially. Um. Uh, well, I actually, no, I push back a bit on that one. Okay. Um, I, I don't think it's up to an industry to only do things that are, quotes, worth it. I mean, the water industry, it's not worth it for the water industry to process our sewage properly. Mm. It'd be a lot cheaper for them just to sort of dump it in the sea. And uh, frankly, sometimes they do. And that's outrageous. We don't ask the water industry do you fancy cleaning up the sewage? No, we tell them to do it. Yeah. And it should be the same for the fossil fuel industry. Interestingly, you mentioned cars. Um, I drive an electric car and I drive an electric car um, because it's a company car for my wife. She works for a construction firm and they've given her a huge incentive to get an electric car. And we don't know whether that's doing our bit or we don't know whether that's worth it. We had two questions on cars. One of them was just simply a statement electric cars do not save CO2, exclamation um, mark. You could talk about that. And we had another one which was phrased in a question, more than 3 billion people in the world have no luxury of a car, nor a hybrid car, and need access to any types of energy. How do they meet greenhouse gas targets? So on the question of, you know, electric cars do not save CO2, um, I mean, that, it's a reasonable point that it depends on the system it's in whether or not an electric car actually saves CO2. 
Um, it costs more CO2, I believe, to actually produce an electric car. I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are on that one compared to um, the sort of lowest footprint alternatives. But what an electric car gives you is the opportunity of eliminating CO2 use entirely. So it's more about the future than it is about the now. Mm. Yes, converting the UK's vehicle fleet to electric now and not changing the UK's power grid at the same time and not changing the way we build our cars at the same time would probably actually have a pretty pretty muted impact on global emissions. But what it does do is it creates the possibility that whoever's generating the energy that fuels your car, however they're doing it, they can either make sure that it doesn't generate carbon in the first place, or they can capture any carbon they do generate and dispose of it properly, pumping it back underground. The thing is, if you're burning fossil fuels in a car, then there's no way of capturing the carbon dioxide you generate. You can't put a great big bag over your exhaust and 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 and, and return the carbon dioxide to the petrol station. It just it just can't work that way. Um, and so so then you're stuck with the only way of getting rid of the carbon dioxide you generate in using your car is by recapturing it from the atmosphere. So sucking carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. And and that's the most expensive way of getting rid of carbon dioxide of all. So what electric cars do, what electrification of transport does, is it gives you opportunities, it gives you options for cheaper ways of decarbonizing your transport. But, you know, the, the questions are right. I mean, you can't just, just buying an electric car, just, you know, it might make you feel better, but you've got to think about the bigger picture. It's got to be part of, a, of an effective system that is decarbonized overall. In your opinion, is there a better way to power transport and electricity could there be a better way i think there could be other ways and i think it's very important that we don't rule things out we're going to need all the options we've got here and i think there's a bit of a tendency to rule things out almost for ideological reasons mm. rather you know and, and we can't afford to do that but we need to keep options on the table so in the uk Electrifying transport probably makes sense. We're not a very big country. The ranges for batteries are going up all the time. Certainly for, uh, for personal transport, it just makes sense to electrify. We're going to have to work at the charging grid, absolutely. And we're going to have to work at um, uh, upgrading our national grid overall um, just, to, just to manage all that additional electricity demand. Um, but it's probably the right way to go. But if you took a country like Australia or America, uh, where the distances people travel are much bigger, then maybe a, a electrifying transport is not the only option for them. Um, and the, there's another way, which would be, um, well, either putting hydrogen um, into into vehicles um, or what we could call upstream decarbonization, basically compensating for the CO2 that, you're, that you generate driving your car by the company that sells you your fuel, capturing CO2 back out of the atmosphere and putting it back underground. And this is what, you know, one company in particular, um, Oxy, is proposing to do in the US. They're proposing to capture carbon dioxide, they're building a plant already, to capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, inject it back underground, um, and they're going to sell the fuels, they're going to they're continue to sell fuels, and they're going to say, you know, you're buying our fuel, it, it's exactly the same as it was before, but the difference is we've compensated for the global warming impact of that fuel. And of course, they're going to sell that fuel at a premium. Um, as I said before, if, if those fuels were available in the UK, they probably cost around 50 pence more than regular, you know, non-global warming causing Oh, no, sorry, regular global warming causing fuel. Um, that's the sort of premium you'd have to pay. And I think most people faced with that premium would probably say, mm, well, in that case, I'll probably get an electric car um, because it's just going to be a whole lot cheaper for driving. And and that that's the way we were, were collectively going. But I think it's important for people to understand that's the choice we're making. We're going for a cheaper option. It's not that we're actually, you know, people look at electric cars and they think that's the more expensive option. But no, it's probably the cheapest way to decarbonize the personal transport sector in the UK. Am I right in saying that the government has actually introduced legislation to say that you will not be able to buy a petrol or diesel car 
by 2030. Is that correct? Well, that's the big debate, of yep. course, with the date behind that. But the plan is that you won't be able to buy a pure petrol or diesel car right. after a certain date. In fact, the big announcement in Sunak's speech was to move that date back from 2030 to 2035. I, I mean, as I said in the lecture, the actual impact of this is pretty underwhelming because we were transitioning quite rapidly away from pure diesel and pure petrol very fast away from diesel. I mean, diesel sales went off a cliff um, after the Dieselgate scandal. And even pure petrol cars are going down very rapidly already and it, because people are buying plug-in hybrids instead. And the reason they're doing that is cost. It's, it's, not, it's not because people are, you know, waking up and, and sort of getting worried about the climate, it's because it's just much cheaper to run. If you've got a plug-in hybrid, you're, go you're going to be spending a whole lot less on fuel. And it looks likely that fuel is going to remain expensive for the foreseeable future. So I think that trend is going to continue. And plug-in hybrids weren't included in the original ban anyway. So um, it, the impact of this change is, is pretty minimal. Okay. Um, it is important to stress that plug-in hybrids um, do save greenhouse gases. But again, depending on how they're used, if you're only, you know, if you're if you're not plugging them in, um, they can end up, you know, using it, generating as many greenhouse gases as the petrol car they're replacing. So um, again, it's a it's coming back to the fact that, you know, we just we need a system here. Um, just what individuals choose to buy is only part of the story. There are plenty of politicians and political parties across Europe um, happy to take advantage of this climate uh, catastrophe that we're having. And we had a question alluding to this across Europe, example, Germany, populist parties are using the climate agenda to gain votes. How would you align your policy to stop these parties gaining votes? I think it's really important that the climate establishment recognises this this danger and the reasonable concerns people have and recognize why where this has come from and it's come from the fact that we overwhelmingly talk about climate as an issue for the individual we 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 tell people you need to turn your heating down you need to buy a heat pump you need to drive you know you need to sell your car buy an electric one and so on it's all and and and, and that and and people individuals find that annoying particularly if they you know, have a job or live in an area where they feel they've got no option but to drive a petrol car um, or but to heat their house with gas. Um, and then they feel, you know, quite threatened by policies that, uh, you know, seem to suggest that that right is going to be taken away from them and they're going to end up with a chilly home or not being able to get to work. So that's why I think we do need to be very clear to people Yes, individuals have a part to play here, but a much bigger part of this problem is the industries that are making plenty of money selling us the products that are causing global warming. And I think that's where populist party, that's the, the right answer to populist parties, because no populist party wants to say they're supporting big industry, um, just as they, they, they like to have a pop at government as well. And it's the fact that the industries that are selling the products that are causing global warming that are making by far the most money out of this whole situation we're in is, is I think, the, the key point to, 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 to counter the, the populist argument that this is just an attack on individuals. What do the 3% of scientists who don't believe human activity causes global warming think causes it? <laughs> I'm not sure it is 3% anymore. And actually, okay. it's, it was always a very misleading statistic in the first place because it all depends on what the um uh what how you know, basically how you ask the question um so i and mostly i mean i i've i actually know i, I worked uh, actually under richard Lindzen, who was one of the key uh, uh people who i'm you know sure but most people would would put into that bracket he was very skeptical about global warming uh science and policy for for many years um and overwhelmingly his view and the views of, of others in, in his position was that global warming policies were misguided, not that there was anything fundamentally wrong with the science that says if you put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you're going to cause some warming. I mean, everybody accepts that fact. 
Um, where people argue is about what level of warming we should tolerate, and that really depends on very much where you live and you know how much you you know how you prioritize impacts on yourself versus impact on other people or impacts on ecosystems and so on so that's not not something that a a scientist can tell you what the answer is to but most people seem to have come around to the fact that we don't want very much global warming thank you very much um you know 1 degree is bad enough we're already discovering um how bad it is at at, at 1. Point to two five degrees, which is where we're at at the moment. Um, so, so most people would like this, like to stop global warming as soon as possible. Um, and I think there, you know, that's that's not about scientists. That's about just what the the world population has collectively decided. It's more that the scientists, the three percent, don't agree with the premise of the question, rather than they think the complete opposite. Yes, right. I think that's a good way of putting it, actually, or that they disagree with some of the inferences that people draw mm. from the answer. So um, I think there has been a tendency, again, of the what you might call the climate establishment, to say, if you accept the science of global warming, then you have to do everything we say. And um, then people who don't like certain aspects of the sort of standard mainstream climate policy package um, feel they've got no option but to say, well, in that case, we're not going to have anything to do with this problem at all, or we just, just don't believe it's that serious. Um, so um, that's really where, you know, the, the, the mistake has been made in that um, we need to make clear to people there's a difference between accepting the science and agreeing on what we do about it. And in fact, you know, I think I welcomed the Prime Minister calling for a discussion of how we get to net zero, we do need that public discussion. I think there hasn't been enough public discussion about really big decisions which will affect people's lives about how we get to net zero. But there's no point in a discussion about whether we need to bother because it's the only way of stopping global warming. And everybody's agreed we do want to stop global warming. You, you said earlier about government and industry working together, government coming up with legislation, creating policies, and industry actually enacting them and doing them. Um, one question we had, why doesn't the government create policies for commercial buildings to reduce the amount of electricity they use or leave running? I mean, I think the government has done, one could say perhaps a belated job, but it has. The, 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 we have made quite a lot of progress in raising um, the standards, building standards of commercial buildings um, in the UK. It's not an area I, I specialize on, but I, I, do, uh, I do understand that that's, that's generally better. I mean, the real problem we have is we have absolutely the worst housing stock in Europe um, are, are in our domestic buildings. I mean, I, I think the performance of our uh, the sort of average performance of many of the houses in the UK is worse than that of houses in Romania. I mean, that's just unforgivable. I mean, we're, we're one of the richest countries in the world. We don't need to muddle along with houses that, that you know, leak energy so fast. I mean, just to give a comparison, if you if you take a typical house in, in, in Scandinavia and you, you heat it to a nice, you know, comfortable room temperature, sort of 20 degrees or so, and then switch all the heating off, it might take several hours to actually cool off by a degree, whereas in the same period, a, a typical UK house would have cooled off by five degrees. And therefore, you'd have got, you know, we, we, as soon as you, you've probably sensed it, if you're in a typical UK house, certainly in the house we're in, which we don't own, and, and I would dearly love them to insulate it a bit better, dropping a hint here, um, <laughs> uh, is, uh, you know, as soon as the heating goes off, you feel the temperature dropping. And that's typical for many UK houses. And that's just... That's a national embarrassment. Mm. Moves us very smoothly on to another question. Can a heat pump actually replace a boiler or will it complement an existing boiler as the heat from the pump is not enough? Well, it can in most houses, but this is it, it not, not necessarily in all. And you do need to insulate the houses properly in the first place. So, I mean, the, one of the... Um, uh, I think frustrations people have with the great sort of fixation on heat pumps versus boilers is actually the most important thing we 
can do, and the, by far the cheapest thing we can do, because it would actually save us money in the very short term, is just insulate our houses a bit better. And this is actually the tragedy in the Prime Minister's speech was that he announced he was scrapping the incentive on landlords to actually insulate houses properly for their tenants. And I was amazed there wasn't more backlash on this because this is really hard on tenants. If you're if you're a tenant and you're only in the house for a year, you you can't often you're not even allowed to get up in the attic and and sort some you know, put make sure that it's properly properly insulated or, or put in double glazing or anything like that. So unless your landlord bothers, um, you've got no option but to pay outrageous heating bills. Um, so that's a case, a, a really good case for government regulation saying no landlords get your act together. You know, you can't sell a house that's unsafe. You shouldn't sell a house that's unsafe for the planet. Um, and, and that's what many of our houses are. On the question of, you know, what happens if a heat pump can't replace a, uh, a what happens if you've got the wrong kind of house um, for a heat pump to replace uh, a boiler, just sort of, you know, pull it out and plug in another one. Um, there will be cases like that. And there are various options available. Um, and again, it's important to plan ahead and to think about how we're going to deal with those that, that fraction of our housing where um, the current generation of heat pumps just probably won't ever be appropriate. And uh, when the prime minister said, well, these people won't have to re won't have to replace their boilers at all, you know, he's left out, well, what are we going to do about it then? Um, now, there's various ways you could still decarbonize those kind of houses. You could start down the path of decarbonization by just putting a mixture of hydrogen and natural gas into the gas network. You could get up to 20% hydrogen, so you could actually make quite a lot of progress on decarbonization without anybody changing anything at all. There used to be hydrogen in our gas when it was town gas made from coal. There was quite a lot of hydrogen in it. So uh, we could start down that route, um, and we could go, of course, further and end up with a mixture of hydrogen and natural gas in the gas network, complemented by recapture of CO2 from the atmosphere and reinjection under the North Sea to compensate for the CO2 generated by any remaining methane in the gas network. That would be an option. Um, that would involve people in, in houses not changing anything at all, but it would mean they'd have to pay more for their gas. So again, it's that usual payoff. Do you want to make an investment now for cheaper fuel in the future? Or, or do you just want to shrug your shoulders and carry on paying more for your natural gas? And I think most people, when they're getting around to replacing their boiler, they probably replace it with something that's going to give them lower bills in the long term. But again, um, I don't think anybody was ever suggesting there was going to be a national program of the bailiffs coming in to rip out your boiler, which was kind of the image that the prime minister was giving. I think that, yeah. was, that was never a policy at all. Um, there is actually one interesting option, which I believe they're exploring in the Netherlands, which is hybrid boilers, where you're, you put you 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 put hydrogen in the gas network, um, but um, people use a, a, a combination of hydrogen and uh, electricity mm -hmm. to heat their homes, and that means that you get the the sort of high impact heat where you need it from the hydrogen, but you get all the efficiency benefits of the heat pump. Uh, thrown in. They're very sensible people, those Dutch. There was a few things in Rishi Sunak's speech that he suggested he's going to get rid of that never actually existed in the first place. I think one of them was a meat tax as well. There was a meat tax being talked about, which was quite interesting. Um, <laughs> anyway, we've you've, you've talked in your lecture... I think lecture... your speech writers got a bit carried away there. <laughs> yes. let's, let's, let's just say that. <laughs> you talked in your lecture and, and today with me about... Um, industry and some ideas about how industry and how government can do things let's then move on to just the average person you and me we had a, a very nice question how is the average person expected to limit their contribution to global warming with the rising cost of living what steps are actually the most useful well the easiest thing for people to do and the cheapest thing um, we, you know, in, in, for, for, for almost everybody, um, is actually just insulate your home better, uh, and and you know that saves you money pretty quickly. And if your landlord's not insulating your home, then get on to get on the case. And that, you know, yes, the government may have made it a little bit harder for you um, to bully your landlord into getting the insulation sorted out, but keep at it. Um, and there's you know there are. You know there are there is help available in many local authorities to do that, and so that's something that people can do, really, really effectively and quickly. Um, and you know, having done that, 
then of course there are other investments we can make in in buying more efficient appliances and so on and generally just doing things more efficiently that's overwhelmingly efficiency is the low hanging fruit here because it both saves you money and it it because it, it saves you fuel fuel bills um and uh it it's obviously good uh for for emissions as well but i think people have to really make it clear to our elected representatives and indeed you know if you if your pension's invested in uh, uh, um, just about any pension fund it's probably partly invested in fossil fuels so you know you you also have a right to write letters to our fossil fuel companies to ask them why not why aren't they doing their bit mm. so uh, i think we do need to yeah we need to, we need to hold our elected representatives and the companies that whose products we buy to account here to make it look we're willing to do our bit as consumers but you've got to step up as well so many people have insulated their houses already and and done that because they've been told to do that is there anything further they can do well i think it is important to recognize that you know as far as housing is concerned you know there is a limit to what you can do as the as the occupant once the building's been built if it's been built badly it's really hard and expensive to what we call retrofit um to you know truly modern standards of insulation so this is a, this is really on our construction industry which to be honest has not done a great job of keeping up with the need to to get to net zero and you know while some construction companies are now stepping up and they're certainly all making positive noises in this direction i think we could do a much better job of making sure that you know new homes that are built really shouldn't have a, 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 a much of a carbon footprint at all because we know how to do it and you know over the lifetime of the building it'll save money and it won't cost the person building the building that much to do it but it's got to be done and that's where regulation really does come in because many people you know for example we bought our house and about 10 years or so after we bought it um we decided to put an extension on and discovered that the end wall of the house it was an enormous it was a semi detached and enormous um you know blank brick end wall and we discovered this end wall was full of fresh air and you know it was a cavity wall so it was legal and and the, we got back to the you know i won't mention their name but we got back to the the company that had built the development and said what's all this about and they said oh well it was in the regs at the time we didn't have to put any insulation into it and they did say oh, they smiled and said yes of course now we'd have to but it's like, oh, for heaven's sakes, you know, it would have cost them. And by that stage, it would it was actually really difficult to to re-insulate it because of oh, various, you know. And uh, it would have cost them pennies to have done it at the time. So that's why we need to really get on the industry to make sure they, they do the sensible thing when buildings are being built. Thank you very much for joining me today, Miles, and thank you for listening. By the time this episode is released, Miles will be preparing for his second lecture in his series, Why 1.5 Degrees Centigrade Matters. Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, everybody's heard of 1.5 now, and the fact that we're aiming, or we decided in Paris to aim to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, but there's plenty of confusion about what it actually means. Um, you know, did we wobble over 1.5 this year? You know, does that mean it's all over for Paris and all that sort of thing? So so we'll be talking about this. That lecture will be happening just before the COP28 uh, climate uh, meeting in Dubai. Um, so it'll be very it'll be very topical because many people are billing that COP as you know the last chance for 1.5 degrees. We, we keep saying it's the last chance for 1.5 degrees. I'm not sure that's a terribly useful thing to say. Um, but uh, so I'll be I'll be really uh, emphasising uh, what it means and why it matters. Why it matters as a target, even if we're going to breach it uh, potentially temporarily. Miles, thank you. 